Hi, I'm Igor Smirnov and welcome into this fourth part of a lesson gems from an Anand Gelfand World Championship match. As usual, I have selected the most instructive positions so that you can learn some really useful tips and techniques. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. This is a tenth game Anand Gelfand. Only four moves were played, and of course this is still a theoretical position. Nevertheless, I'd like to use it to illustrate one important idea. Sometimes you observe a game between two strong grandmasters, and you may be wondering oh, why do they think for so long about ordinary moves. Really, sometimes a grandmaster plays a very natural move, let's say develops a piece after considerable thinking. So let me show you why does it happen and what they think about during this amount of time. For example, in this position both players certainly can play tried moves unthinkingly. Let's say black can play knight f6, d5, then something like bishop e7 and castle. However, if you follow this way, often you'll experience problems in a middle game because you'll be unsure of what plan you should choose and generally what you should do. That's why the right way is different. You need to compose a plan right in an opening. Based on this plan, you'll be able to arrange the best position for your forces and then your plan will go flawlessly in the middle game. Let's apply this approach for the current situation. As for white, he doesn't really want to go d4, because it will open a position, giving more open diagonals for blacks to bishops. Additionally, this will exchange off the blacks doubled pawn c5. Therefore, most likely white will play d3 instead, and will try to keep the position closed. In the future, maybe white will try to attack the black's weak pawn onto c5. For example, white can do it with a knight from c3, a4 and then maybe with some other pieces. Ok, in short, this is what white is gonna do here. Now let's think about black. If black plays d5, this will leave... Ok, let's make any move for white. If black plays d5, this will leave the c5 pawn unprotected, because black can't play d6 anymore. And after that, white can bring more and more pieces to attack that c5 pawn and white will capture it sooner or later. White can play b3, bishop a3, move the knight to a4, and the c5 pawn will be captured. With that in mind, black doesn't really want to play d5 and most likely he'll play d6, trying to keep his c5 pawn protected. However, if black plays d6, let's say after white castles, if black plays d6, white can undermine this pawn easily by playing e5. And after eliminating the d6 pawn, white can then get back to his plan with attacking uh, that doubled pawn onto c5. So the black's move d6 looks good, but if he plays it immediately, then this idea fails. And that's why in this position, most often black decides to play e5 first and only after that support it with the move d6. Uh, obviously the e5 move is impossible right now, white will simply capture the pawn, that's why black needs to protect the e5 square first. For that purpose he often develops his knight onto g6 and only then plays e5. And when the central situation is stable, then he may play d6 and everything will be good, he'll get a really strong central position and some open diagonals for his bishops. You see, it was impossible to come to knight e7 move without understanding the black's plan. By the way, instead of castling, Anand played b3. And it's also a pretty interesting moment. An amateur player, after seeing the b3 move, can say that, well, this is very obvious, I could have played such move in a second, white just prepares the development of his bishop. A 
hope that now you can see that everything is not that simple. And taking into account that black is going to advance his pawn to e5, white wants to develop his bishop onto b2 and take an additional control over this crucial square. As you can see, the b3 move is much more profound than it looks at first glance. So I want that you make an important practical conclusion of how to play in an opening and what to think about. First you think about your plan and about your opponent's plan. Based on this information, you can then find the most suitable positions for your pieces. That positions should obviously favor a realization of your plan and hamper your opponent. That's why grandmasters sometimes think for too long in a seemingly easy position of an opening. Ok, let's see what happened after that. Galfand played e5. That's a bit sudden move, but you already can understand its idea clearly. Uh, Black is trying to realize his plan right away, without any preparation. Uh, this is not a blunder, because after knight e5, Black plays queen e7, trying to take the pawn back after queen takes e4. White played bishop b2, and now in order to push the knight back, Black played d6. Oh, what should White do now? What do you think? Perhaps White should take the c6 pawn, and then after queen takes e4 and queen e2, there will be an unclear endgame. White is a pawn up, while Black has two bishops and maybe some activity. Is that right? No. Because if we make a move back, then after knight takes c6, instead of queen takes e4, black has much simpler solution queen to c7 and the c6 knight is trapped. In order to avoid of such sad situations, you should keep in mind one important rule. When you're going to make a move forward into an opponent's territory, you should be very careful and you need to check the variations twice. An opponent's territory is certainly under control of his forces. If you penetrate there, your piece can be easily trapped or captured. That's why it's so important to be, able to be careful and to check variations carefully. When you play moves on your own territory, often you can play them quickly just based on your positional understanding. But when you're going to penetrate into opponent's territory, you need to take time, think seriously and check all the eventual aggressive replies of your opponent. A lot of games were lost because people forgot about this rule. So I hope that you'll take notice of this and will follow it in your own games. In the actual game, Anand certainly haven't fallen into this trap. Instead he played knight c4, and after queen takes e4 on the next move, queen takes e4 and queen to e2, they got an approximately equal endgame position and agreed to a draw after several next moves. This is the 11th game, uh, Anand is playing black, and in this position he played queen to a5. An idea of this move seems to be obvious, black is attacking the white's pawn onto c3. At the same time, it doesn't look very dangerous for white, because white can easily protect it with a bishop, or just push the pawn forward, which was played by Gelfand. After that, however, Anand revealed his real intention, and he took c takes d4, and then suddenly played queen to h5. Now we can see black's real plan. He transferred his queen to the king side, and now it puts quite unpleasant pressure onto the white's position. Together with the black's light square bishop, this can favor black's eventual attack on this area of the board. This is a quite typical transfer, and I like that you remember it. Let's take a step back. Uh, your queen is the strongest piece, and of course, if you can bring it closer to an opponent's pawnock, uh, this can strengthen your attack a lot. 
in order to make it happen you can use the fourth rank. Uh, quite often you can play queen a5 or sometimes queen d5 and after that move your queen to h5 and this idea will be realized. This is a quite typical maneuver and I recommend that you remember it. This is another position from the same game. Now the black's rook is obviously attacked, so probably black should retreat with the rook. Is that right? Not exactly, because black also has a very interesting move knight to c5. This is a counter blow, and now if white takes the rook, then after knight takes b3, black saves his extra pawn and additionally uh, fox the white's rook and the bishop. Here black is just winning. How can you find such counter blows? Pretty easy actually. First you should avoid of uh, making defensive moves mechanically. Very often when opponent is attacking you, you just make a defensive move backward. Instead I recommend that you keep focus on attack always. If you do that, you'll find counter blow moves very easily. Often counter blows can be very effective and can bring you an immediate win. In this position, knight c5 is almost winning, but white has a sudden counter trick. Can you see it? Yeah, white should play rook takes b7, getting back black's extra pawn. And then after knight takes and bishop takes d4, that will be a balanced and approximately equal position. Anyway, I recommend that you uh, remember our key idea from this example. That idea states two main things. First, when opponent is attacking you, you shouldn't make defensive moves mechanically. And the second idea states that you should keep focused on attack always. This will help you to find attacking moves and to find counter blows. It's the final game with a long time control in this match. Anant is playing white and this game was really amazing. In my opinion it's the best game they played. Ok, now let's have a closer look at a position. Uh, we have seen a very similar situation in one of the previous games today. Uh, here Anand played e5, we already know this idea, white is going to undermine black's pawns and then attack the black's doubled pawn c5. Black replied knight to g6. It seems that black just develops his forces and the next moves will be e takes d6 and bishop recaptures. At the same time black has a very sudden reply. Instead of an obvious move e takes d6, he can and should play another move queen f6. After playing b3, white weakened this long diagonal and now black can make use of this factor. In order to save his rook, now white has to play something like d4, which certainly helps black. Um, after that black will repair his pawn structure for a bit and also will open position for his bishops. This was an interesting snare found by Gelfand. Instead he could have used another very interesting idea as well. Let's make a few moves back. Ok, here. Instead of knight g6, black could have played d takes e5. Can I take this pawn now? At first glance it seems that knight takes e5 is impossible, because black will reply queen d4, taking the white's rook and knight, and it seems like white is losing. However, everything is not that easy. You can see that black plays a lot of moves with his queen, ignoring the development of his other forces. This gives white an interesting idea of making a sacrifice but getting much greater development and trying to start an attack on the black centralized king. This will happen after the white's move knight to c4, queen takes a1, 
Now the white's b1 knight is attacked, but white can protect it with a tempo. Bishop b2 attacking the queen. Queen takes a2 is the only move. Now white can gain one more tempo by playing knight to c3, attacking the queen once again. Queen a6 move is forced, and now white can make a very unpleasant check knight to d6. Now black can't go to d8 because after that knight takes f7 will win the h8 rook. That's why black has to go king to d7 and now knight takes f7. Okay, this is nearly the end of the force in line and we can evaluate a position. Uh, white sacrificed rook, uh, however, the black's position is completely destroyed, his king is exposed and for lack of development it's difficult for black to finalize his development normally. Therefore white has great chances for a successful attack. I think that a player like Mikhail Tal would play such a position with great pleasure for White. Anyway, it's very amazing that such a situation could have happened in a World Championship match. In the actual game, instead Black played Knight to g6. And here Anand prepared a brilliant novelty. He played h4. White doesn't try to protect his e5 pawn and moreover he even forces black to take this pawn. Now let's try to understand his idea. Black really took the pawn, knight takes and then white simply played knight to d2. So this is a positional sacrifice and this is once again really a brilliant idea. White wants to use black's doubled pawns to keep his bishops out of the game. This is a very interesting and actually a typical idea. Uh, when you want to develop your bishop, normally you need to move a pawn forward and open a diagonal for your bishop. However, when you have doubled pawns, they are quite immobile and it's very difficult to move them forward. For example, let's focus on the black's light square bishop. How can black activate it? This is a quite difficult task. Without the e5 pawn, black could have played e6 to e5 and the bishop will get an open diagonal c8 h3. However, with the doubled pawns this is impossible. Without the c5 pawn, black could have played c6 to c5 and open this long diagonal for his bishop where it would be very active really. However, again, with these double pawns this is impossible. You can see that doubled pawns can lock a bishop and keep it out of game. This idea first happened in a classical game Winter Capablanca. Let's quickly have a look at it. In this position, the white's dark squared bishop is in a cage. There is no way for white to move this bishop back into game. Without the white's doubled pawn on f3, white could have played f2 to f3 and then move the bishop to f2 or maybe even to e1. In the current position, thanks to the white's doubled pawns, white is unable to do anything. That's why in fact black has an extra bishop into play and his position is strategically winning. Now we got back to the game and on Galfand. Uh, being aware of this strategical motif, Galfand played a brilliant positional move c5 to c4. He sacrificed the whole pawn just to open up a diagonals for his bishop. After knight takes c4, first black got a new open diagonal for his dark squared bishop, secondly his light squared bishop got two new diagonals to be placed on and in this position black really played bishop a6 trying to exchange off his passive bishop and double white pawns. After queen f3, 
Galfin played another brilliant move. Queen to d5. Black sacrificed two pawns in a row, because now I can capture the e5 pawn. So black sacrificed these two pawns just to open a position and to give free space for his bishops. There followed f6, knight f3 and e5. This was really a great plan for black. Yeah, he sacrificed some pawns, but now he got a strong center, a lot of open lines for his bishops and rooks, and quite an initiative position. Uh, quite often in an endgame two bishops compensate a pawn, and this happens in the current position as well. That's why later on they agreed to draw after just several next moves. Anyway, this was an incredible game where both players found a very sudden and interesting positional sacrifices. Moreover, this happened several times in a row during only a few opening moves. This was the last video in this series Gems from an Ungelfant World Championship match. I hope you enjoyed the lessons and learned some useful information and new tips and tricks which you can use in your own games. Thanks for watching and talk to you soon in the next videos.